But I'd like to welcome you to uh, Bentley College's Center for Business Ethics uh, fourth Raytheon Business Ethics uh, lecture. Uh, we've had uh, a wonderful lectureship series that was first sponsored by Sears Roebuck and had uh, 10 wonderful speakers in that series over about a five-year period. And now we are uh, very honored to have Raytheon sponsoring our CEO lectureship series. And this is the fourth in that series. Um, this lecture is also being co-sponsored by Bentley's Institute for Women in Leadership and the Center for Business Ethics, uh, as well as the Institute for Women in Leadership, is a partner in the Bentley Alliance for Ethics and Social Responsibility. I also want to invite all of you to a reception after the lecture in the forum, which I think most of you know where that is. It's on the same floor, uh, just in the middle of the building, and we'll have some food and drink, and uh, you'll have a chance to meet some of uh, our uh, leaders, our business ethics leaders that have come from companies around uh, the Boston area, and also uh, hopefully our speaker and some of her team that has come from Xerox. I'd like to say a couple of things about our sponsor. Uh, but first, before I do, I'd like to introduce uh, Patty Ellis, who is the Vice President of Ethics and um, uh, Compliance, Business Ethics and Compliance at Raytheon. She's down here. I won't make her stand, but you'll have a chance to meet her, hopefully, in the reception. Uh, I've known Patty for <coughs> at least a decade, if not more. She has been uh, the Vice President of Business Ethics and Compliance at Raytheon since, I think, 1994, uh, certainly over a decade. And uh, she has built at Raytheon uh, one of the best business ethics programs in the country. It's uh, certainly seen as one that other companies benchmark against and look to for best practice. Um, and uh, Patty has been the leader of that effort over the last uh, 10 years or more. Um, Patty also represents Raytheon at the Defense Industry Initiative. She's on uh, the working group there, and she's been a member of the board of directors of the Ethics Officer Association, and uh, Raytheon is a sponsoring partner of the EOA, as well as the center being a partner with the EOA, uh, the Ethics Officer Association having started here at the college and is now over a 1,000 members strong. It's good to have uh, their uh, executive director here, uh, Keith Darcy, in our audience as well. The Raytheon Lectureship in Business Ethics at Bentley College is made possible, as I've just said, through the generous support of the Raytheon Company. Raytheon, as probably many of you know, is not only a neighbor, uh, but more importantly, I guess, the industry leader in defense and government electronics, space, information, technology, technical services, and business aviation and special mission aircraft with sales of 20, over $20 billion in 2004. The company employs 80,000 people, and it has built a reputation uh, for adhering to the highest ethical standards in the industry. Therefore, it is quite appropriate that this lectureship series is supported by Raytheon since it aims to illuminate and promote ethical values and conduct in business, highlighting best practices in corporations throughout the United States and abroad. So again, I want to thank Patty, and I want to thank Raytheon for this continued uh, partnership with the Center for Business Ethics at Bentley uh, and continuing to support our Raytheon Business Ethics Lectureship Series. 
I'd also just briefly like to mention that David Frischkorn is also in our audience today. David, I've known David for four or five years, and David is the head of Xerox's uh, business ethics program. Uh, so hopefully you'll ha also have a chance to talk with David uh, at, at the reception following the lecture. It is with real pleasure and appreciation that I introduce our Raytheon Business Ethics Lecturer, the fourth in the Raytheon series. We state on our flyer announcement that Xerox is one of the most enduring brands in business today. In fact, I still refer to copying as Xeroxing, which probably gives you an indication of my age. And it is our speaker, Ann Mulcahy, who leads this historic corporation, this global leader in document management solutions, with $16 billion in annual sales. Ms. Mulcahy is Xerox's board chair and CEO. Mrs. Mulcahy started her career at Xerox in 1976, the same year the Center for Business Ethics was founded, I might add. And she started as a field sales representative, selling copiers in the Boston area. And I just heard that her son is going to the other BC, Boston College, uh, and only because of that do I mention that name in this audience. But <laughs> as I said, they are a friendly competitor, and we love them as well. Um, since 2001, as the head of Xerox, she has reinvented the company into an innovative technology and services enterprise, far exceeding its original business goals. In fact, prompting Money Magazine to call Xerox the great turnaround story of the post-crash era, an IBM for the 21st century. Ms. Mulcahy is also a member of the boards of Target Corporation and Citigroup and a member of the Business Council. She is also a board member of Catalyst, a nonprofit organization supporting women in business. And over the past several years, she has been consistent by such publications as Business Week and Fortune as one of the top CEOs in the country. Please join me in welcoming Ann Mulcahy. So thank you, Mike, for the very nice introduction and the very warm welcome here. I'm really delighted to be in Boston. Um, it is where I began my career almost 30 years ago now. And, um, and I think particularly it's great to be here because it gives us an opportunity to talk about a subject that's really near and dear to our hearts at Xerox. And, um, and most importantly, it's an opportunity to really get acquainted uh, with Bentley Center for Business Ethics. Uh, you have been um, at the forefront of this business dialogue uh, long before it uh, was in the headlines. And um, having had three decades of experience, my guess is there's more that you can teach us than uh, we can uh, certainly share from our perspective. So what I'd like to do with my time today is really spend time thinking and talking about how we approach business ethics at Xerox and, most importantly, leave plenty of time for dialogue and discussion to hear what's on your minds. So to tee up the conversation, what I'd like to do is provide a very brief overview of what we're doing today under the broad umbrella of business ethics and social responsibility. More importantly, explain why we believe good practices in social responsibility and business eth ethics helped save Xerox during the worst crisis in our history. And explain that why what we're doing today actually feels pretty inadequate as we think about um, the future. So I'll start with a brief description of what we're doing. And um, I would say that social responsibility and business ethics at Xerox are so ingrained in our culture, we've had a long history, that it's um, sometimes hard to know where to begin. During the decade of the 60s, when Xerox came to prominence in Rochester, New York, we were growing rapidly. and. Um, the community, like so many others across the nation, was actually torn apart by race riots and a struggle for social justice. And social responsibility was really just in its infancy. 
Um, centers like yours didn't exist at that point in time, and uh, certainly there weren't a lot of books telling CEOs how to behave or what to do. We had an incredible leader, um, just a, a, a real um, important part of our history. His name was Joe Wilson, and he was the man who founded Xerox, and he really didn't need a book. Um, he knew instinctively that a healthy Rochester was good for Xerox, and that corporations actually have a moral obligation to give back, and that no company can or should operate independent of its community in which its people live and work, and that behaving in an ethical and responsible manner was the only right thing to do. It was actually also very good business. And um, he articulated a set of core values that are still with us today. So they are enduring, and we often refer to them as our North Star. And through Joe's leadership in the mid-60s, we actually um, embraced those problems. We donated both human and financial uh, resources to the community. We actually started a lot of organizations that uh, were designed to spur economic growth in the inner city. When we were growing, we provided hundreds of job opportunities and training, and we launched a diversity program that today is still recognized as one of the best. So the, Joe's involvement, actually, during the 60s in these uh, civil rights struggles, um, it actually changed the face of Xerox at the time and set us on this course of social involvement that I think has become part and parcel of the way we've done business every, every, ever since. And that really has led to what we view as kind of a five-pronged approach to social responsibility and business ethics. So I'll uh, very briefly describe those uh, five approaches, the first being um, environmental management. We take it very seriously. And before it was popular to do so, um, actually we began this effort decades ago. We adopted a policy that protects the environment and the health and safety of our employees. And the principle is central to the way we do business around the globe. So we articulate this environmental goal in just a few words. We say it's making waste-free products in waste-free factories to help our customers attain waste-free workplaces. Last year alone, we diverted about 160 million pounds of waste from landfills. We recycled 85% of our non-hazardous solid waste, and we've promulgated very tough standards with all of our paper suppliers. So environmental uh, responsibility is really at the top of our list. Second, we've done a lot to uh, overhaul and rejuvenate our governance process. We've, um, we have embraced Sarbanes-Oxley in a very constructive way. We've uh, certainly promulgated uh, a new and up-to-date code of ethics. We have trained and we've retrained all of our people on responsibilities. And we've given employees a very easy and anonymous vehicle in which they can raise issues. We've also enabled our board to be just about totally independent and involved in the governance of our company, and it's really been a beneficial change. So we do treat good business ethics as everyone's responsibility. People have to know what's expected of them, how and where they can raise issues, and we have a world-class process due to David and uh, certainly the team of uh, Xerox leaders that um, ensures that every concern and our company is examined thoroughly, and if we find a problem, we fix it. No company can exclude themselves from problems, but it's all about how quickly you find them, raise them, and fix them that become uh, the advantage. The third plank is actually um, our corporate philanthropy, and it's really spearheaded by our Xerox Foundation. We invest about $15 million every year in nonprofit organizations, and I actually use the word invest pretty deliberately. We don't write a check and walk away. We consider our donations to be investments in improving the organization's capacity to positively impact the quality of life in the community and in some tangible and measurable way. So we support about 400 organizations each year, and about 80% of those cases, there's a Xerox person involved, either on the board or volunteering or serving in, other, in some other capacity. So, we love this synergy between Xerox people and Xerox money. It really uh, ensures a great return on our investment. Fourth, um, we have leveraged and been involved in volunteerism uh, at the grassroots level for a very long time. Last year alone, some 15,000 Xerox people in the United States alone um, participated in their communities under the auspices of Xerox. 
One example, which I love, um, in Xerox New York, we've um, put a group of Xerox Lean Six Sigma Black Belt experts um, helping community organizations improve their business processes, boost productivity, and improve client satisfaction. So just a, a wonderful marriage of community needs with the uh, particular Xerox competencies. And there's lots of other outlets for our people. Every year they contribute about $2 million to the United Way. They serve on thousands of nonprofit boards. It's something we actually encourage. They hold public office. They also participate in social service leaves programs, which allows a select number of Xerox employees every single year um, to serve in the community for periods of as long as a year at full pay. And of course, um, last but not least, is our focus on diversity. And um, we actually treat this as a line responsibility. I think it is um, a really important and differentiated approach. It is not something that's nice to do at Xerox, but very much of a business imper imperative and one that you must do to remain competitive. So senior managers throughout our company are evaluated on their performance, and um, we spend a long time really embracing what we call a balanced workforce. And uh, that means you have to be focused both on short-term and long-term gains and goals. And we inspect the progress. We hold people accountable. Even when we downsize, we make sure that there's no disproportionate impact to any of our constituencies. And we include diversity in our core values. We talk about it constantly and consistently, and it's an integrated part of uh, our business. So that's kind of a really brief um, description of what's at the nucleus of our business ethics programs. And if you have uh, certainly any desire to go into more depth, please ask us questions or catch us uh, after this session. And I'd have to say that we don't think that they're terribly unique if you take them one by one. Where I believe that programs like this actually do become unique is the fact that we've been pursuing these strategies for a very long time. They have long roots, a lot of history in our company, and they've also uh, been integrated into the way we run the business. And that's really the way that uh, you can ensure that um, it is imprinted into the fabric of the company. So they're not uh, kind of off in the margin initiatives and standalone. They are part of our culture and part of our DNA. And we kind of like to say that it's what makes Xerox Xerox. And we communicate about both social responsibility and business ethics constantly. These six core values are deployed to every single one of our employees every single year. And for the past year, in our annual objectives, we have living our core values as one of those objectives, and they're attached by a list of uh, metrics and ways to be accountable and track progress so that um, we kind of make it part of the line business with hard measures. So this is just giving you some idea of how ingrained um, it is in our culture and uh, how it is in the fabric of Xerox. More importantly, we care about it. Um, Xerox people care about it. And that really brings me to the second part of this talk, and that is really how social responsibility and our focus on business ethics helped us save Xerox during uh, certainly the worst crisis in our history. And I think it would be fair to say that uh, and I'm sure it's been discussed in many of these forums that unless you've been living on another planet, you know that we just have emerged from a, a crisis that certainly was the worst in our, in our history. And it really left us um, teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. Um, so the story I'd like to tell is uh, how we got into trouble, how Xerox people got us out, and why they didn't leave us when we uh, needed them most. So I'm going to actually uh, turn back the clock to about May of 2000. Um, just a year earlier, things appeared to be going very, very well at Xerox. Our market shares were improving. Uh, there weren't any really tough competitors in sight. Our financials looked great. The growth in our stock was outpacing the market by a wide margin. And um, we had just made a change in leadership that appeared to be going very well. So we were all focused uh, on a very bright future. But um, with alarming speed, things began to unravel in the latter part of 1999 and early 2000. Crises happen very quickly. Problems have deep roots and uh, long histories, so um, the visible signs can emerge like that, but uh, they usually trace back to something uh, much deeper in your history. In our case, we had attempted too much change too fast. Um, while we were focused on all the internal turmoil, our competitors stiffened and uh, took advantage of an opportunity. 
It was at about the same time that economies at home and um, abroad were starting to weaken. We actually, at the time, uncovered um, accounting improprieties in Mexico that turned into a worldwide SEC investigation and, to say the least, began to distract and suck up a tremendous amount of management time. And I think we would be uh, prepared to say that we took some actions that in the broad daylight of hindsight were just simply dumb. So we kind of thought we coined the phrase at the time, uh, the perfect storm, because there was uh, a fairly uh, overwhelming uh, set of events that uh, were compounded and put up upon us. And I think we could have dealt with many of those problems individually, but um, the compounding effect really did overwhelm us and set us back on our heels. So by May of 2000, we were in deep trouble. Our revenue was declining uh, double digits. Our profits had gone to zero and went negative. Cash on hand was shrinking. It actually got very close to zero. Debt was mounting. It was just under $19 billion. Our customers weren't happy. We weren't at our, our most responsive best. Our employees were obviously uh, leaving for greener pastures, and uh, shareholders had seen the value of the stock cut in half, and it was continuing to head south. That was just about the day that I was named President and Chief Operating Officer of Xerox. <laughs> so typically, uh, I think you'd say it fulfilled a lifelong dream. In this case, uh, that was not the case. Um, in a meeting I had with uh, Warren Buffett, uh, he told me that I hadn't gotten promoted. I had actually been drafted into the war. And uh, I think it was a pretty uh, accurate description. But I have to tell you that we had a couple of aces in the hole. And the first was um, a very loyal customer base that really revered the Xerox brand and understood the compelling history and wanted Xerox uh, certainly to succeed. And um, we had tremendous loyalty during very challenging times. And the second was an incredibly talented and committed workforce who loved Xerox and were willing to do anything to help save the company. So we went to work. Um, the plan wasn't brilliant. Um, the execution was pretty good, but um, we had a plan with three major blanks. The first was to focus on cash generation relentlessly, and uh, that was kind of a skill that we lost during the 90s, um, during the dot-com boom. Uh, we forgot that companies actually run on cash. Um, we, um, we really are good at managing cash and uh, put a lot of focus on that, not obviously improved our liquidity issues. We took a billion dollars out of our cost base to improve competitiveness and uh, really be able to face off uh, favorably in the marketplace. And at the same time that we were really being tough-minded about cash and cost, we actually invested in our core businesses to ensure we had a source of future growth. And I have to say that the results have been pretty stunning, um, both in size and time frame. We have dramatically reduced our debt. We'll end this year probably around $8 billion, and all of that is the financing of our customers' receivables, so there's no general debt in the company. We improved our cash um, situation dramatically. We've been delivering operational cash flow of just under $2 billion a year for the last few years, and we have a three and a half or $3.2 billion cash balance. And in 2000, um, Xerox actually lost $273 million, and in 2004, we made $859 million. So the focus of this actually isn't on the financial turnaround. It actually um, gets the most attention, but it's really on that third leg of the strategy, which was investing in the future and making the right decisions on behalf of all of our constituencies. We strengthened our core business to ensure future growth. Even as we were dramatically reducing our, our cost base, we were maintaining our research and development spending in all of our businesses. In fact, we didn't take a single dollar out of our R&D um, and in our core business, not one. So as a result, the last few years have been our uh, biggest uh, product introduction years in our history. We've brought 75 new products and, uh, and solutions to the market in two years. And um, three quarters of our revenue come from uh, products and services we've introduced over the last two years. So it's really been uh, an incredible uh, pipeline of innovation brought to market. And our customers are responding. Equipment sales have been up for about the last eight quarters. Um, that's a, met a bellwether metric for, up for us. So we feel that certainly we're on our way and um, far from declaring victory in, uh, in this kind of uh, business climate, but uh, certainly back on our feet. It has been an extraordinary experience uh, having this opportunity um, to lead Xerox through this turnaround and, um, and what may be in the Understatement of all times, I think uh, we have learned a lot 
about leadership and trust along the way. And at the depth of our crisis, Xerox people really wanted to know how we would get back on track and that our values would not be compromised in the process. So uh, we thought about it uh, in terms of even as Rome was burning, people wanted to know what the city of the future would look like. And um, I plead guilty that I didn't immediately get it in terms of people needing, particularly employees, a clear picture of where we were going to be heading in the future. And I believe it was the most single often asked question, not whether or not we would survive, which was what I was expecting, but what would we look like when we came through the crisis? People really needed to have a view that they'd be a part of a company they'd be proud of, that had a reputation that they could uh, look at and feel uh, proud to belong to. And I believe it was just a great sign of Xerox people's uh, optimism and took it as a very good sign. I'm not really good with um, um, strategy documents and round words, so we did something a little different and uh, actually wrote up a fictitious Wall Street Journal article that um, we dated 2005. This was back in 2002, and we actually described what Xerox of the future would look like and what people would say about Xerox in terms of its, its values and what it learned and its financial performance and the kinds of value it would be bringing to its customers. And we would literally make up quotes by certain of our constituencies to give it this feeling of uh, credibility and reality. And um, I have to tell you that people loved it. To this day, I have to say we were uh, gifted in the sense that a large part of what we had hoped for um, has been realized, and, uh, and people still ask, well, the Wall Street Journal article said this, and when is this going to happen? And we have to remind them that we did make it up. So, uh, <laughs> But it was great advice that I got from people because not, soon, uh, not too soon after I was named president of the company, people told me that um, you really need to talk about what needs improvement when times are good, and that when times are bad, you have to assure people and give them the confidence that you have a vision to uh, make it better. So we uh, took that to heart, and I have to say, wherever we communicated to our people, to our customers, we did talk about the reality of our challenges, but we were uh, confident that we could overcome them, and I have to tell you, the response was overwhelming. People really signed up, um, defection slowed, and hope rekindled and energy returned. And I have to tell you that um, the vast majority of our people really hung in there. We actually gave them an ultimatum and said, um, you have to have an appetite for what's going to happen over the next few years. You have to want to sign up, roll up your sleeves, and work. There's no room for uh, armchair critics. And um, so make that decision, roll up your sleeves and work, or we'll help you leave, because this is a time when we really need people to be actively engaged and involved. And um, they signed up, so we've had uh, the benefit of having an incredibly committed and motivated uh, set of Xerox people helping us turn this company around. And I think part of it was because they believed that they were part of a special company. And uh, many of us actually joined Xerox because it stood for something beyond just the bottom line, as important as that is, that they were very proud of the value system and the reputation the company had. So we would have, uh, we would not have survived these past few years, I can assure you, if we didn't have that loyalty. And, um, and I do believe that some of that was um, stems from our heritage of being a good corporate citizen. So I think, um, like all um, companies who have positive histories and heritages, our past behavior was like money in the bank. And we were able to draw on that uh, to really help uh, focus on uh, giving the company a chance of survival. And it really did give us this reservoir of goodwill that we called upon uh, when we were in the midst of our financial difficulties. Um, and we stayed the course with regard to our values. We continued to make donations and fulfill all of our obligations through the Xerox Foundation. We actually focused more on volunteerism in the community because we knew it was a source of, um, of tremendous commitment and, uh, and contribution on the part of our people. Um, even as we let people go, we did it uh, certainly in the, in the best way possible, and uh, we also ensured that we didn't compromise diversity as we went through that experience. We actually accelerated our environmental programs because not only were they good for the environment, they were good for business, and it was a much more efficient way for us to operate as a business. And we overhauled our governance programs, which I think has enabled our company to find um, a much more appropriate way to work. 
So this was insisting on doing things right, not just quickly, but right, no shortcuts. And I think it was all part of this experiment that um, business success and business ethics are not uh, mutually exclusive. And if, in fact, they are synergistic. <laughs> and there's actually a lot of great research about that, a lot of which I'm sure that uh, you've reviewed here. Um, one that I'm particularly fond of is a Harvard study that found that companies that balanced concerns for employees, customers, shareholders, and society grew at four times the rate of companies that focus solely on shareholder value. And I find that a great source of hope. And I think it's intuitively true for most of us here today that that should be the case. And certainly uh, it, ha it was true at Xerox. If Xerox people had voted solely with their checkbooks, they would have left. But they actually um, voted with their hearts. And, um, and I think that it was the opportunity of a lifetime, the opportuni opportunity to really uh, save a company that actually cherished and believed that um, we could make the world a little better uh, than the way we found it. So it was a galvanizing force. And there is no question that it was the will of Xerox people that pulled this company back from the brink of bankruptcy. And interestingly enough, um, you know, for the last three years, it was tough to, we kept our heads down and focused on the business. There wasn't a lot of recognition for that, but uh, all of a sudden, uh, the world is beginning to notice, and whether it's uh, Fortune's most admired companies or uh, Business Ethics Magazine, all of a sudden, uh, Xerox is being recognized for leadership in, in those areas. So we feel that uh, that's, that's just wonderful recognition for our people. It would be a great place to end my speech, but I have to tell you, I think it would be disingenuous because um, social responsibility and corporate ethics, like every other facet of our business, is a rapidly moving target. Uh, we like to think of it as a race without a finish line. So as good as we might think we are today, um, we have to be much better tomorrow, and not by a little, but by a lot. So that really brings me to the last point, and I'll wrap up here, and that's why we're doing, why what we're doing today seems somewhat inadequate when we think about the future. Um, and you can look at a whole set of statistics that make that point in a very compelling way. One recently about global companies. 50 global companies are larger than the economies of all but a dozen or so countries. And if you throw in their supplier base, these companies uh, actually spawn and support. The results are even more startling. And I think with that kind of economic might comes just awesome responsibilities in terms of companies' behavior. And all you have to do is just consider a few of the facts that we all live with in this world. Uh, more than one billion of the Earth's population doesn't read or write. One-fifth of the world's population goes to bed hungry every night. In Asia, 60% of the population still lives on less than $2 a day. More than 40% of the world's population still doesn't have basic sanitation. And more than a billion people drink water that is unsafe, leading to the death each year of over 2 million children. So unfortunately, you could go on and on. Those kinds of statistics uh, are, uh, are more than prevalent. And I think all of you uh, in this business center deal with a lot of those realities uh, every day. And I do think that we ignore them at our own peril, both moral and economic. So what I'm suggesting is, is that there's a real need to ratchet up our expectations across business of what we can do collectively as a community. And um, I don't think by any means we have all the answers. I'm not even sure we have the right questions. But if we truly try to push ourselves to think beyond the narrow limits of what is and ask the tough questions about what if, I think it would make a huge difference. And um, I think uh, it would be really um, a great place to end from a, a quote that Joe Wilson always used to use that we still use uh, in business all these years later. But um, he was a very literate man, and he was always quoting Plato and Shakespeare with ease. And uh, here's one from Robert Browning, and I'll skip the Elizabethan um, English and paraphrase it. But he says, one man seeks a little thing to do, sees it and does it, and he keeps adding one by one, and soon he hits 100. Another man pursues great dreams. He aspires to a million. He dies before he reaches it, but he misses by just a little. And I think it's incredibly wise counsel as we think about um, corporate responsibility. And I know that um, you all, uh, being connected with this center, believe in that philosophy uh, that we really have to reach for the stars. And even if you miss it, we'll have made a much larger leap forward. So from a Xerox perspective, um, we're certainly proud of our accomplishments and uh, certainly proud of the progress to date. 
but uh, I have to tell you that we are sobered by how much there is left to do. And uh, I think our commitment is, is that we will uh, consistently keep trying. So I want to thank you for your attention, and I would be delighted to open it up, Mike, uh, for questions if now's the time. Thank you. Okay, uh, now it's your turn to ask some questions and get some response from uh, Ann on uh, what you have, what your thoughts are. So who would like to uh, go first? We have microphones here, uh, one being uh, manned uh, by uh, Tommy Borklin, who is our visiting scholar from Sweden, and uh, Jamie, who is our uh, uh, Leon Sullivan scholar, uh, senior, our uh, here at the Center for Business Ethics. So, questions? Right here. Speaking of the future of Xerox, I know you're trying to get more service and solutions based. How do you plan on gaining market share against companies like IBM that are seen as stronger in that field than Xerox and not a document company, but also a service and solutions based company? Great. Um, so happy it's a business question. Uh, <laughs> this is a marketing opportunity. Um, <laughs> But um, interestingly enough, I, we work with the IBMs and the EDSs of the world. Um, you know, the, they're an IT services company, which are, covers a lot of space. Um, the world of document management requires a deep expertise in areas that um, Xerox really has a heritage in and a lot of research and development in areas like content management and imaging and uh, color technologies and a whole set of uh, opportunities. So. We often work in partnership um, with the IT services company because we've got the specialties and expertise in document management. So today, out of our $16 billion, $3 billion of them are delivered on services. So it's, it's a big piece of our business. Fortunately, it's the fastest growing part of our business. But I think uh, we live in a world today where customers are not interested. And we have some customers here with us today, which I'm uh, very pleased to, to welcome them as well and thank them for their business. Um, but we live in a world where customers don't want to buy hardware anymore. <laughs> a lot of money on it. It's been somewhat of a disappointing investment. They want solutions to their problems, and that's really the approach that we use with our customers now. How can we help you, particularly as it relates to document management problems and the whole world filled with them? How can we help you uh, solve those kinds of business problems? Thanks. Up here? Can you hang on one second? Tommy will be right there. With cord. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming today. Thank you. Um, I think we can all say that uh, the pay gap and CEO compensation is significant. Mm -hmm. um, as both a CEO and a board member, how do you reconcile that or address it um, with in the confines of social responsibility and corporate and business ethics? Well, I think. Um you know, I don't think anybody debate, would debate whether uh, CEOs get paid a lot of money today, uh, me included. And um, I would say that there's progress being made there. Um, it's a very timely question since our proxy came out today. So, <laughs> so even if I wanted to tell you something that wasn't true, it's out there. So uh, <laughs> I make a lot of money. Um, but it's, um, it's taking a very different profile than it has in the past. Um, you know, certainly everything that um, I do is calibrated around the performance of the company, both in terms of um, what the board members have put in place in terms of performance metrics inside the company, which, by the way, include reputation and um, corporate responsibility and business leadership in terms of uh, ethics, as well as all of the financial returns of the company. So they do make, I think, a very broad set of judgments, but that are based upon uh, the progress of the business as well as shareholder metrics in terms of uh, the progress of the business. So um, they will calibrate and use their discretion each year in terms of the percentage of uh, progress that the company's made and uh, ratchet that accordingly with pay. We are out of the options business, which is where a lot of big money uh, gets made and got made, uh, certainly um, as it relates to um, you know, executive compensation. So. Everything we do now is based upon uh, performance-related, both uh, shareholder and um, board set metrics on pay and bonus, and what we call performance shares. So they're not just granted, they have to be earned, and they're consistent with uh, the performance shares of the company, uh, the performance metrics of the company. So I think it's, 
I think you have to look for a couple of things. By the way, I think we're seeing executive comp, and I know that the, the, the media would suggest the opposite, but I can tell you personally, executive comp is actually coming down in lots and lots of companies. And, um, and I think you have to look for a couple of aspects of it. One is it's got to be connected to the right performance objectives, and it's not just one. <laughs> you have to have a board that actively uses discretion um, as it relates to making sure that the fairness and appropriateness of compensation is in place. And I think everything uh, has to be tied to um, the ability to have it reflect fairly against the progress of the company so that there's none of the disconnects of getting paid lots of money when uh, all of your constituencies haven't seen the same kind of value. So I think we're making progress. Are we there? Probably not. Um, there's a question up in the back. Uh, Jamie, maybe you without a cord can handle that better. <laughs> we'll let you do the lower tier, uh, Tommy, with that question. Um, again, as all of us do, welcome to Bentley. Thank you. About 25, maybe 30 years ago, there was a set of business strategy cases about Xerox's social responsibility leave program. Yeah. Does that program still survive? Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, the author of the program is here with us today, and I'd love for him to say a couple of words, because I think it's one of the most incredibly wonderful programs that we've ever had as a company. I mean, if you knew how excited people are to be able to get a full, fully paid leave to do something that's just so important to their communities, that's in their hearts, I mean, it's just a big deal. So Joe Cahalan is our Vice President of Communications. He is the author of the Social Leave Program at Xerox. And Joe, I would love it if you could just maybe give a couple of examples of what people are doing and what kind of impact it has in the company. Sure. I, I ha have to put in a caveat since this is a center for business ethics. I didn't start it. <laughs> I came along the year it started. I was buying it. <laughs> and I've been associated with it ever since. Yes. It's, uh, it's 30 plus years, 33 years, and it allows a group of people each year to take up to a full year off at full pay to work in the nonprofit sector with a guarantee that they come back to the same job at, at Xerox. Uh, over the years, the causes that employees have elected to do have changed. There's you found, find now more dealing with uh, hunger and AIDS and battered women than you did 30 years ago when it was more job training, although that still registers high. Um, I would say, because I didn't create it, <laughs> that the genius of the program was threefold. Um, the three guidelines that were put in at the beginning were all employees are eligible, so factory worker to Vice President of Research and Development, and both of those job categories have, in fact, been on leaves. Uh, the second is the uh, leave takers apply for the leave. So this is not Ann Mulcahy going to the chief financial right. officer and saying, could you free up somebody to work for a year? That, that's not a good way to go. The people who get freed up are the people who can be freed up. So this is competitive. People apply for it. And then the third thing that I thought was brilliant was that a jury of peers, a group of seven Xerox employees, make the final decision on who goes on leave. And then the only way that can be appealed is to the CEO. And every CEO has been tested once <laughs> and only once. <laughs> and they've all made, in my opinion, the right decision that people went on leave. Yeah. And you have, what, 20, 25 people per year? This year it's about 11 or 12. So it's, it's varied. And the program and survived through the darkest years. Ah, uh, uh, I raised my hand yeah. during the darkest period. I, we, we let go a lot of uh, good, valued uh, members of our Xerox family. And so we thought it was just unseemly and inappropriate to be letting people at the same time take the year off. So for two years, we had a moratorium on it. And as soon as we could, we put the program and put the program back in place. And it was, it was one signal to people, one very important signal that, as Ann talked about in her talk, was that the values had been maintained and that Xerox was out of the worst of the crisis. And, you know, I think it, it touches a handful of people directly, but it actually impacts every single employee. Uh, every single Xerox employee can tell you about our social leave program and uh, love it. 
even though um, a handful of people participate in it, yeah. so it's pretty special. I, one last, because of the way the program was set up, 92% at last count of the people, which I always yeah. find fascinating, who are on leave are addressing a social problem that they or their families have personally experienced. It's a big deal. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, John. Uh, next question. Uh, there's one right there, Tommy. Uh, Ms. Mulcahy, I am a customer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> my, name is, uh, my name is Steve Cronin. I run a company in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, print, a Mercury Parts Print Mail. Company. Yes, yes. Right. We just, uh, we just bought a uh, 6060 digital press. Thank you and, so much. Uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could share with us uh, your, your decision-making strategy and um, your decision-making decision strategy on global issues. And then also if you could just talk about uh, change management, uh, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Okay, great. Um, well, I think, um, you know, global is, is an interesting topic. I think one of the things that we discovered very quickly, the reason why it's so hugely important to have a value system and a culture that has a common definition about um, business ethics and social responsibility is, is that, you know, when you're in the middle of a crisis, you can't imagine how quickly it can uh, cave on you when you're operating in 160 countries if you don't have a really good thread of understanding of how you work and how you behave. And um, so this context of, you know, global consistency, global values, or an understanding of what it means to be a global company is hugely important and something we have invested a tremendous amount of time in in the last four or five years. Interestingly enough, I would say we were always a multinational company and that that was, you know, relatively easy compared to being global, which means that you actually do have um, standards and expectations and uh, offerings and contracts and all the things that go into actually being a global provider and also maintain a sense of discipline and, um, and standard setting across the world as well. I mean, we, we ran into, our problems started in Mexico, by the way, as we went into all countries, we discovered lots of issues throughout the world that had to be dealt with. And one of the things that we really determined very quickly is, is the need for this kind of global community understanding of risk and reputation and what, what you're responsible for when you're running a Xerox franchise is absolutely um, of a critical nature. We also decide clarity um, in terms of how you operate globally is hugely important. So. We have bought out some of our joint ventures because we could no longer accept the risk of working with partners that didn't reflect, quite frankly, our values that um, you know, we knew we had to have around the world. We've also sold operations where we couldn't feel comfortable that we could get control. And uh, we have made dozens of those decisions around the world so that where we do business in a direct way, we are responsible. We have the accountability. We have the leadership that we feel comfortable with. And um, so it's, it's really created a completely different decision matrix for us in terms of how we do business globally throughout uh, all of them. You know, I'm, we, we do business everywhere, so it's, it's a pretty unique challenge for Xerox. And, you know, I think that, you know, that's a big part of, you know, how you can basically sign off on financials and feel a degree of comfort. Yes. Well, I think, um, yes, I will. And how do, what's my decision making? How do I make uh, decisions for the company? I think, um, you know, there's a few criteria that for me are absolutely, um, you can't break. Customers and employees come first. And um, they are equally powerful constituencies in a sense because they're kind of, there's a codependency there in terms of uh, how you serve customers through your through your employees, but we constantly put it through the lens of customers and employees. So shareholders really are kind of a, an outcome of making decisions through the customer and employee lens. Long-term versus short-term. Um, we're a company that, um, you know, we've seen the, the pain 
of too much short-term thinking, not just in terms of um, trade-offs that are made um, that are unacceptable, but quite frankly, the damage that can be done to real core capabilities in the company like innovation and, um, and certainly uh, the value system. So long-term versus short-term is, is hugely important. I'm not a big believer in consensus, but I'm a huge believer in engagement in our company. <laughs> So I work, I'm a, I like to roll up my sleeves and work with our management team, get input and, um, and really hear the views. And I mean really hear, I, I think one of the things that you learn through a crisis is how to listen. We went through the motions of listening for a lot of years and I'm not sure that we did a lot of real listening. I think um, there's a little, there's, there's a, a touch of humility that's required to, uh, to really listen and take input and be adaptive that comes with um, a crisis that hopefully we never lose again. And uh, so as an executive team, as a management team, as a company, I think we're doing a much better job of listening to our constituents, constituencies, trying to really reflect and adapt. And, um, but at the end of the day, decisions are hugely important. <laughs> and not making them is one of the most, um, I think, um, the biggest problems a company can have when they create an environment where it's, you know, it just stagnates and uh, you don't make enough decisions. So I'd rather make 10 and have eight of them be right than make two and missed eight sets of opportunities to actually be in front of it. So those are a few thoughts, but uh, so I'd call it very participative, but, um, but not the old, like everyone has to agree environment. So it's a little bit different from that perspective. Thank you. Uh, yes. Hi, thank you for Hi. coming. Um, in the beginning of your speech, you talked about how Xerox is embracing the new Sarbanes-Oxley initiative. Um, can you talk about whether or not you think if this initiative had been in place before the crisis started or during the crisis, that would have prevented a lot of things from happening? It's a great question. And, Did everybody uh, hear the question? Maybe, should I repeat it just to make sure, but it's a great question. It's, um, we talked about how we're doing Sarbanes-Oxley in a very constructive way. As we reflect back and look, um, had it been in place, um, you know, four or five years ago, would it have prevented some, many of the issues that, um, that Xerox certainly, uh, that challenged us uh, during 2000 and 2001 particularly? So the answer is yes and no. And let me uh, kind of describe what the yes is. There's no question that I think Sarbax has brought a more systemic approach to understanding and mitigating risk in our company than uh, anything that we had in place before. Um, it's created a context of prioritization that's hugely important in our company. Um, you know, painful, by the way. I mean, as we went through and you do this full scanning and scoping of your company, which is costly and time consuming, the benefits the next year is, is that you actually get to focus and prioritize your efforts around the things that actually create the most risk and uh, have the, and I think it creates um, guidelines and tension points that actually have you act upon and you know, fix things that uh, really do provide risk to the environment. So I can think about some things. It would have created a degree of consistency that may not have prevented all the problems, but would have allowed us to fix them a hell of a lot quicker. We would have had something we could have gone to to actually deploy and create an environment for fixing problems. We had chaos. Everybody did it a different way, so there was no consistency. There was no documentation. There was no process management. I mean, Starbucks is really a process. And I think it would have helped us address so many issues more quickly had we had that discipline within our business. So, you know, so the business control aspects of it, the discipline, the prioritization, all I think could have provi provided a much better foundation for better decisions and certainly better reactions. Would it have prevented all the issues? Absolutely not. <laughs> And I think one of the things that we need to be very conscious of, no matter what the regulatory vehicle is, a lot of this is about leadership. It's about having the right people in the right places making the right decisions. There is no substitute for it. So I worry when we are relying too much on process and regulation to actually provide risk-free environments. Um, I think it is absolutely um, undermined if you don't have the proper leadership in place. There's nothing that's going to help me discover whether I have um, a particular weakness or problem in Eurasia 
other than a great leader who kind of gets on it, brings it to my, uh, the attention of the management team, and puts actions in place to fix it. This whole deal isn't about preventing problems. You can't be in big global businesses and uh, not have huge amounts of unanticipated problems in your business without mistakes, without people who, you know, just make honest mistakes. So the issue isn't preventing them. Part of it, hopefully, isn't prevention. But the other piece of it is, do you have a system in place where it's brought to the table, it's dealt with promptly, and it's addressed, and uh, so it doesn't really develop into um, the real crisis that it could. So my opinion is, is that we have to have at least as much emphasis on the proper kind of leadership in every single country and business sector that we do business in, or quite frankly, we'll still have lots of issues in business. Wonderful answer. Um, yeah. There's a question right up in the middle there. Sorry about the cord. <laughs> um, how do you see the interaction between your ethics codes and those of your uh, supply chain? And do you see it? Do you see your influence on them? as an important part of your future corporate responsibility. You know what, could you just repeat the question? Yeah. I wasn't, I'm not How even you, sure where you are. <laughs> thank you, thank you, got it. How do you see the interaction of your ethics code with that of your supply chain? Yeah. And do you see your influence on your supply chain as an important part of, of your future corporate responsibility? Absolutely. I mean, I can give you um, specific examples, but I would tell you that we all have a long way to go. The, portfolio of suppliers is just enormous. And um, so I think we've begun with, um, you know, the, the big hitters, if you will, the strategic relationships and suppliers where we really have influence and clout and relationship. I'll name two. And um, one of them is Flextronics, who's a, um, a manufacturing outsourcer for us. It's a huge part of our business. And as part of the negotiations, we actually did a way we work, you know, kind of values-based negotiation that I mean, it was really fascinating because, by the way, we insisted they be a Lean Six Sigma company with us so that we could partner on the kind of uh, working approach that we had together. And there's a lot of discipline and um, values within a Lean Six Sigma culture that I think are hugely important in terms of uh, shared perspective. Um, you know, their CEO and I sat down and actually, uh, when we cut the deal and there was lots of, it was a values conversation. <laughs> is about, you know, if I picked up the phone and we had this problem, what would you do? How would you react? And, um, and we really tested that. And I think it's interesting that you don't get to that in terms and conditions in a contract. <laughs> the best relationships we have from a values perspective are the ones where you really look people in the eye and you have trusting relationships that get tested and you make the right decisions together. And I think uh, this is once again where the quality of leadership in a supplier organization is hugely important to your ability to really transfer and work with in a common framework for, for ethics. Another one is GE. Um, GE does a lot of our back office operations. They, their GE Capital is a huge uh, strategic supplier for us. And, um, you know, they actually uh, made a bet on Xerox when the going wasn't good because of uh, the fact that we had a culture that they felt comfortable with and, uh, and a leadership team that they felt, uh, you know, was really anchored in the right business decisions. And uh, so it was much more of a qualitative judgment about doing business with us than it was a quantitative judgment about the lucrative nature of the deal. So I think that we have incorporated uh, certainly a lot of um, specifications, uh, certainly into our supplier expectations that do deal with business values and uh, how business is conducted. But I think it's getting more challenging. Um, if you look at the where the supplier base is sitting more and more frequently, that's a big deal in terms of making sure that, um, and that's really what, act, what led us to um, the conclusion that we also had to have clarity of relationship where, where, however and wherever we operate because we are responsible. I think one of the interesting things on, uh, in the Starbucks um, you know, process is, is that in material relationships, <laughs> be certified um, in order to really get clearance as it relates to the overall uh, certification for the company. So we actually had that situation with a supplier who um, did not pass, and we had to remediate and invest a lot. And I got to tell you, 
that supplier is forever changed or they will not be doing business with Xerox in the future. So there's, there's some real teeth now actually behind the risk assurance process and the, uh, and the, the leadership that's associated with your supplier community. I don't know, David, do you want to add anything to that? Do you have? Yeah. This is David Frischke. Hi. Yeah. Uh, I suspect one aspect of that question would deal with, uh, in the defense industry right now, you see a lot of initiatives where the uh, top contractor is reaching down into the supply chain and making requirements from a code of conduct perspective of the entire supply chain. Yeah. For example, Raytheon, our sponsor, sends a letter, a request every year to Xerox because we're one of their suppliers, uh, saying we want you to explain what our ethics, your ethics and compliance program is like, what your code of conduct is, because we have to meet uh, sufficient criteria to stay within their supply chain. Absolutely. Xerox has not taken that step yet. Uh, that, that would be a, a big task, and we don't have quite the same ethics risks from a regulatory perspective as the defense industry. What we do, though, is in all of our vendor contracts, there, in the terms and conditions, there is a paragraph that has ethics and code of conduct requirements. So I'm not setting the standard for you. I'm telling you what my standard is, and I expect that you have a program in place that reflects that in your own business. And when you're on my site at Xerox, you have to abide by my code of conduct in addition to your own. Thanks, David. I uh, have, a, have a question, uh, and it, it kind of piggybacks on what David was talking about. There's a lot of emphasis today on culture, building an ethical culture. In fact, the new amendments uh, to the federal sentencing guidelines talk about yeah. developing a culture in which appropriate ethical decisions can be made. Could you tell us a little bit about some of the strategies that Xerox is employing internally to make sure that that kind of culture, that ethical culture, is there and will continue to uh, be there? Great. Well, I, I probably, uh, you'll hear a theme here, it's a little repetitive, but I think probably the first test is leadership by example and leadership by decisions. So I think the first test is, is that um, you walk the talk, that there's a level of integrity between uh, everything that's done and what you espouse with regard to, you know, and I think that's very straightforward and very obvious, but oftentimes um, not where it should be in terms of um, corporate behavior. Every decision you make, every time you appoint a leader, you make a statement about what's important in your culture, and I think you can never, ever waver on making sure that your leaders emulate and kind of are models for what you believe you're setting the example for. And I think that's, um, I, I would tell you that we made mistakes in the past that way, where, you know, you appointed the person who always gave, did the results, delivered the, the numbers, but quite frankly, wasn't necessarily the leadership model that was really displaying that um, you had to do it there was a way to work, there was a set of standards that had to be followed. So I think just who you have in leadership is a statement that it's hard to get beyond that. I think it's, um, it's, it's really disingenuous to suggest that you can communicate anything or put anything in print or set expectations if they're not reflective of the decisions that you make and who you appoint to represent the company from a leadership perspective. And I think those, there's a lot of those moments of truth that are actually far more important than perhaps um, a lot of the process discipline we put in place. Obviously, everyone signs, signs codes of conduct. We have all sorts of acknowledgments, training sessions, retraining sessions. I mean, one of the things that um, we do as it relates to our ethics hotline is, is we actually publish kind of the decoded case studies of what the, you know, for people who this isn't just a nice to do, this has consequences and I think we put a lot of teeth in it and we're consistent about making sure that, you know, if you, if you walk outside the lines at Xerox, you don't get to work at Xerox and that um, there's a level of consistency in ensuring that those consequences take place. So I would believe that um, we probably don't do everything from a process perspective, but I think we do an awful lot now. And uh, as David said to me earlier, I think we benchmark shamelessly in terms of people we learn from like Raytheon and others to make sure that we've comprehended as much as possible from a process perspective. 
but I think the powerful moments of truth really put the teeth behind the process and the program that say, do you make decisions consistent with that value system? Do you appoint people who represent that throughout the company? And, um, and when you blow that one, credibility is instantly gone and very difficult to restore. So I think it's this combination of really good process, good discipline, uh, consistency of uh, actions along with uh, leadership behavior that's totally consistent with what you're asking people to do. I think that's a wonderful place uh, for us to stop. And right. Let us thank you so My much. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. It's a pleasure. Great. Thank you.